thank you for being here. It's so great to have such terrific turnout. My name is Carrie Donahue. I'm here from the PRX training team, and I'm joined with I'm Lindsay Abrams. I'm the training lead at PRX. And your very own Ann Donahue, no relation to this lovely lady. And I teach here, I teach journalism here and, and have taught podcasting once and want to do it again. So if you want to take my class, sign up. You want to take her class. That's <laughs> what we're going to say. So or send people to take her class. So um, I want to say that we are delighted to have been invited to run this workshop with you today uh, by both Boston University's Marketing Communications Department and the Office of Research. Um, and this is part of the strategic communication series here at Boston University. It helps promote, uh, pr uh, promote skills necessary to communicate research and um, faculty expertise in effective, compelling, and accessible ways. So obviously this is a, a formal way of saying, again, that we are delighted you're here and that I hope that at the end of the time that you'll have some uh, takeaway skills, whether you're going to start a podcast or whether you are going to actually be on a podcast. Um, Everywhere we go, we get to talk a little bit about what PRX is. We started, we are a public radio, like public radio podcasting uh, distributor uh, and creator. Uh, we are based uh, here in Boston, although we also have an office, office in Minneapolis. We are out in Alston. We have a couple of locations. This is our podcast garage at 267 Western Ave. Uh, it is a Harvard-owned building, I'm sorry to say, in a BU room. Um, but it is a, oh gosh, it's a, it was a former Jiffy Lube. And uh, it is actually, like we converted it. We have jumpsuits we usually wear when we're training at the garage. Uh, and we have a classroom space. Um, uh, there is also a four-person studio. It's very inexpensive. It's a dollar a minute to rent time there. You can rent uh, lots of time or a little bit of time. We really made it as a maker space so that you could come and create things. And this is part of what PRX does. Um, Basically, where, what we try to do, and we started in public radio. I always like to tell this origin story about PRX because it's very digital, but it sounds so ancient now, even though we were founded in 2003. And the core thing was that we were going to make a public radio exchange where people who made audio files could post them on the web, on the web, on the internet, so that public radio stations could then preview audio, and if they liked it, they could download the audio and then play it on the radio. And this was a remarkable change from what had happened prior to that moment, that simple B2B kind of thing we know the web so, does so well. And prior to that, you had to buy time on satellites, like physical satellites in space, or you had to send program directors uh, CDs of your work to which they never listened to them. If you saw any program director at any point, there was just like a pile of dusty CDs on their desk. And it was really hard to get access to public radio. So PRX opened that up. And since then, it's been a matter of both a technology company and a content company working to get help producers reach their audience. And about a couple years ago, we started a training program uh, where I'm the head of it. Uh, we basically want to make sure that podcasting, which is now very hot, I've been joking for a while that my dentist is asking me to help him with his podcast, uh, which is super <laughs> awkward because I can't talk. Um, and uh, and we, so we know that there's lots of interest, um, but we know that there's money coming in, and that's driving some of that interest. And as that sort of money comes in and things get a little more commercial, PRX is really here trying to make sure that that sort of entry point stays open. So we do a lot of training with early stage podcasters. Um, but I myself, I come from the background of public radio. I uh, have worked in public radio, and I was teaching at Columbia University's uh, Graduate School of Journalism. Lindsay is also a journalist and is a journalist. We're, we're going to talk to you some today about just where we all fit in this podcasting ecosystem, ecosystem as it's evolved. Uh, we like to start our presentations with a little bit of audio. Um, who here is uh, like currently listening to podcasts? Do we have any podcast obsessives? Okay. Okay, great. That's all. Anyone who has not yet listened to a podcast, this is a no shame zone. It's fine. Ah, oh, excellent. Okay, well, then we're just going to play you some stuff a little gratuitously then. Sometimes we're playing it because people are like, what is this? And so um, we do want to play, but this is a show that we distribute, Ear Hustle. We have a podcast network called Radiotopia, and uh, it is, um, we have a number of great, like 99% Invisible, Criminal, and one of our, our most beloved shows, really, because it's really special, is Ear Hustle which was founded through a, uh, an application process. The team from, there's a training program in San Quentin. Uh, one of the people applied as a podcast idea, and it was a sort of nurtured and fostered at PRX. And this tells the story of what day-to-day -day life in San Quentin is like for the prisoners. So uh, this clip, you're going to hear someone talking about what it's like to have pets uh, in San Quentin. I love animals, so yeah. Since I've been in prison, I've had Black widows, tarantulas, a lot of grasshoppers, beetles. At San Quentin, 
Inmates aren't allowed to have pets, but some guys get creative, like Roach here. Gophers, rabbits, I had four swallows, a toad, praying mantis, 21 snails, frog, red-breasted finch, whose arm broke, pigeons, I had a desert mold that was partially paralyzed, teddy bear hamster, just really lazy with an attitude, the centipede, and it was a wolf. It was a bad little monster. I had two fish that had babies twice. I had a tarantula broke out one time. My celly said, yo, spider got out. I got into crime for survival and I was hurting. And I thought it was a way to get back at people. This was the way to make them feel with the pain that I felt. Then it slowly became just a part of what I did. I'm incarcerated for second degree murder. We got in a fight with someone and I ended up killing him. I always like the juxtaposition. I mean, there's a lot of sonic things happening there. There's layering of, uh, you know, the interviewer is talking this list of, um, you know, uh, the, the animals and uh, insects that he's owned. And then that juxtaposition of his voice of his own story and kind of that the space in which ear hustle lives, you know, the experience of people who are living in prison. Um, the host of the show, Erlon Woods, that you heard his voice in there kind of table setting a little bit. Um, he uh, had his sentence commuted by Governor Brown uh, last uh, 2018 at Thanksgiving, uh, in part because of the work on the podcast that he'd done. So, so now the podcast has evolved, in which uh, you know Erlon is telling the story of his life outside of San Quentin, and there are new hosts who are telling, you know, continuing to tell stories about daily life in San Quentin. It has some of the features. I mean, it has in some ways. This is not, we would have been doing this kind of work in in radio for a long time. But it has some of the uh, longer form unfurling of the story, uh, the intimacy of podcasting, and other uh, features of podcasting that we're going to talk about that you have almost certainly felt if you haven't yet sort of identified what, what the draw is or what the special features are about it. This is, this is my favorite motion. <laughs> it's how people usually look at us when we start something. Just to go over what's going to be happening over the next two hours is we're going to give you an overview of the podcasting landscape. Um, we'll talk about some key first decisions to make if you are planning to make a podcast of your own. We'll talk a little bit about thinking like a publisher, things about like how to get that podcast online and also where does the money come from. Um, we also are going to talk a little bit about best practices for guests. If you've invited it to be on a podcast, how is that different from other press you might do and how can you approach it? We'll talk to you about um, a ton of resources that PRX can provide within Boston and online as well as from Boston University itself. And we'll ask you all to hold your questions, but feel free to write them down, take a note. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A and some like one-on-one -on -one chat at the end. Great. And uh, we'll say that we've kind of uh, tried with this training program that we've been doing. We've been running some really big 20-week trainings. We run trainings of all different lengths, but some of the resources that we've developed have been for some 20-week trainings that we're running both with public radio stations through a project called Project Catapult, and then also through uh, Google. We've been doing international podcast training uh, with the Google Podcast Creator Program, which we created some 101 videos, which we'll show you throughout at different moments. But remain alive and free and available to you as a resource that you can use right away to help you know some of how we frame like early decisions about podcasting. Um, OK. This woman, you made, uh, it's easy to make fun of the New York Times style section sometimes um, because they tend to draw you know, broad strokes. But this question, uh, have we hit peak podcast, is often on everyone's mind. In part because you just start to feel, I mean, uh, the Good Place finale had a reference to podcasting, Saturday Night Live the other, you know, just a few weeks ago, had the devil making podcasting. I mean, there's literally podcasts have really sort of hit that cultural moment where uh, they are easily mocked and then also um, very meaningful. Uh, so I, I'm excited about that. It's the greatest time in the history of audio to be working um, you know, in audio. Uh, so this woman, we tell her story. Um, I actually did, her name is Morgan, first name. She decided to make a podcast. Uh, she got together with a friend. They made an advice podcast. You cannot find it. I've looked for it. Um, and uh, they made six episodes together. And then they sort of deemed it a failure. What happened? They didn't find any audience. They were like, oh, this isn't really worth it. Uh, the New York Times sort of took her story and sort of framed it as like, oh, it's just podcasting the new blogs. That's a reasonable question. There are certainly a lot of podcasts. There are over 800,000 podcasts in the Apple directory. Only probably about a third of those are actually active now. So lots of people have tried podcasting like Morgan did. Um, but I like her story for two reasons. One is that I'm, I'm a long time. I started in community radio. I actually think people making their own media is pretty inspiring. And I hope she had a terrific time with her friend and that they made six terrific podcast episodes that meant a lot to them. 
Um, and then the other thing I think about her is I know why she wasn't successful. Because one of the key things is she didn't really think about who she was making the podcast for. She thought about what she needed to convey rather than what the person that was going to receive it needed to hear. And so that's her mistake, but it's actually a pretty common one. And it may be sometimes when we speak in institutions, and sometimes I say with deep respect for faculty, you know, you're stuck where you know that you have meaningful information and a deep body of knowledge that you want to convey to people. You're actually, many of you in this room teach, you know, you're very good at it. You've probably got all your jokes worked out, like you've got the like punchlines. Um, but the trick with podcasting, because it is on demand, because it is a niche media format, you have to really be thinking about when someone comes to your podcast and seeks it out, you know, what do you actually want them to like think, feel, and do when they're done listening to your podcast? And I think that's where you really want to sort of, that's where our whole training program asks you to really think deeply about that. Um, imagining that all of your expertise is told in a good story. Hook people early with a good story and they'll stay with you um, through a long journey. I am sure that Morgan, our friend Morgan, I feel such sympathy. I hope I meet her someday. It could happen in New York City um, where I'm based. <laughs> so I hope that she uh, gets back into podcasting sometime. And I think you won't know. I think as we get a lot of people in podcasting, whether everyone will be mon you know, successful monetarily, it's unlikely. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes at PRX we say we like to be the uh, loving cold bucket of water on your podcast monetization uh, dreams. It's very hard to make money with podcasting, but you may have other reasons to do it. And so that's what we're going to focus a lot on, framing what their success metrics might be, other reasons you might want to get into podcasting. And by the time we're done today, we'll have talked some about the you know, technical parts about how you're going to do that. Okay, so just a definition because people throw around podcasting a lot, and I really like to keep it very simple. Podcasting is on-demand audio that you access over the internet. Often another feature that will be described to it is that you can subscribe to it. It's essentially an audio file added to an RSS feed, so you can subscribe to it. So it'll come to your phone. Uh, you can just say, I really like that podcast. In fact, you will hear, if you like a podcast, you will hear on the podcast, please subscribe, like, and review our podcast over and over again. The subscription means that the podcast will come to you whether you listen to it or not, which gets down to some tricky metrics of the industry as well. Uh, I think it's useful because we, many people will have, you know, we know radio, still a lot of Americans listen to radio, just talk about points that are similar uh, and the points of difference. Um, so we know that podcasts are on demand. That's a key thing. We were doing a training recently with a terrific radio station and I had kind of an old school DJ, he does an amazing American songbook thing and he was just like, why isn't this radio? And finally I was like, oh, because somebody's going to start at episode one and they're going to listen and they're going to then listen to episode two and that alone is like a very significant difference. It's one to actually think about. You know, a lot of people when they first like find a podcast they like, go and listen to the back catalog. Um, so you, and you'll hear it a lot in really great podcasts like, this is episode three. If you haven't listen to episodes one and two go back you know um, but on demand is where most of our media is these days and podcasting is part of that we say that radio is a companionable and an intimate medium like you listen to the radio while you're doing something else and it's always had an intimacy when I teach young journalists how to write for radio you always think of one listener in mind um, and so what happens with podcasting largely because we're listening in the ears and we're sort of listening as we go out in the world is that it's like extra intimate. I say it's like hyper intimate. And that's something to think about too. It's partly why when you have that body of knowledge that you want to convey, when you're a little too remote to your listener and you're not thinking about telling that one person or that one student, if you will, you can start to just sound a little hollow in the ear. It's sometimes why you listen to podcasts that are broadcast shows and they don't sound quite right. You're happy to have the time shifting, but they don't sound like that other experience you might have, which is when you listen to a podcast host that you just really dig, like the way they think and, and explore the world, that you're like, hey, I want to go back for more because I'm really curious about how that person thinks and how they engage, that intimate connection. It can be really, really deep. I tell a story about how I saw Michael Barbaro at a big public radio conference. I listen to The Daily every morning, as I recommend everyone should. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I've been in this business a long time, and even I was like, oh, Michael Barbaro, like, like he knew me or something. And so later I saw him, and I was like, I'm so sorry. We don't know each other. It's just that every day I listen to you as I walk my dog, and I feel like I kind of know that guy. So um, podcasts, radio is always, always contextualized, mostly complex stories, but you can really go deep in podcasts. Um, you know, there are like, I, Slow Burn is an example I use in this case, if you've listened to that podcast, the first two seasons, 
The first season unpacked uh, Watergate. The second one unpacked Clinton's impeachment. And the third one was about <coughs> Tupac and Biggie. But <laughs> like, OK. But they, uh, each one, they just took over many episodes, like went really back through the history and said, like, what was remarkable about this? And really drawing some very pointed connections to modern day, uh, but really contextualizing uh, experience of uh, impeachment um, in the first two seasons. I like to say it's an embarrassment of niches. If you like anything at this point, there's a podcast about it. Um, so if you are into D&D, &D, let me assure you, there are so many podcasts. But um, there are also podcasts. There are religious podcasts. There are comedy podcasts. There are incredibly deep verticals that are out there, which when you are going to start your podcast, one of the things we're going to say is like figure out who else is out there making something in that same deep vein that you are in. Um, podcasts have a chance to bond and deepen communities. Radio has always done that. Public radio stations always explain this. You know, you'd like if you meet somebody who really likes that same radio show you do, you're kind of that's groovy, you know. But like uh, podcasts are even more so. If you go to live podcast shows, there, you know, people even like podcasts you don't know have a big range. People get so into being able to connect with each other and like, it's, oh, you like that podcast too. It's really, a, it's a, and we really recommend live events as a way to you know, connect with your listener and for them to connect with each other as a big part of the experience. And then this other lesson, which is not small, is like say it's they're natively global. You know, this is like they go everywhere. So we're doing podcast training. You know, I'm going to go to um, um, Nairobi in a couple weeks to go to the first African pod festival. And everyone who's making podcasts in Nairobi, we can hear them here. It's like a pretty, it's pretty easy and remarkable. Oh yeah, and this last one. Oh, this one is our favorite. So it's an opportunity to take risks, experiment, and reach new audience. That's true for you. You know, you, many of you are faculty, like you're reaching students. You, you know, have your reputation in like whatever context you've built it. But the podcast can be a new space for you. It can be a new way that you take something that you know deeply and um, engage with the world. I get to just like talk to you for a bit. I promise they're also going to talk. It's not just, I'm not just hogging the stage. <laughs> I want to point out a little bit, this is a graph about the history of podcasting. The term started, well, actually, it was in 2003 that they figured out how to, like, there was a table. We actually have this table at PRX because it was at the Beekman Center at, um, at Harvard. Uh, so they said that they could figure out how to attach the MP3 to the RSS feed. That's when podcasting began in 2004. It had a name. A Guardian a reporter called it podcasting. 2005, that first spike there on the left, that's when uh, Ricky Gervais like, kind of had a first like, you know, kind of big hit at the moment. And then there was this long period from about 2005 to the fall of 2014 in which lots of people were trying podcasting. And then a lot of people were finding it was harder than they thought it was going to be. And a lot of people stopped podcasting. And it was just kind of lumpy. Here, public radio, my brethren like, had a very strong advantage because we were already making very good quality sound product. And just time shifting it was kind of the key thing. You still see shows like This American Life at the top of all of the lists of podcast success. Um, but a really critical thing happened uh, in 2014. The two things, actually, and the two things are very connected. The first is that Apple made the podcast app native on the iPhone. If you have an iPhone, you have an app, it's purple, the icon it looks like a little mic. And uh, that meant that you didn't have to do a sec like two steps, essentially, to listen to a podcast. Download an app and then download a podcast. It reduced the number of steps. The technology got easier. And a month later, Serial Season 1 came out. And those two things, the double whammy of really excellent content and uh, the remarkableness of the ease of access were kind of drove podcasting in this moment we're in now. So you, it's very likely that you, like many people, know that podcasting, maybe you had a vague idea it existed before. But you, when you think about it, you're like, wow, it's really been in the last five or so years that it's really become big. You are not wrong. This is really like a huge second wave. And that growth, we only have it to about 2017 there. But it is like just hockey stick level of growth now. So. Just commenting on this even further, so 2015, after these two events happened, you had a podcasting landscape with some very familiar names. It's American Life. You see PRX. You see NPR, um, Gimlet. Uh, you know, you see uh, Stitcher, things that play big players. iHeartRadio got in early. And now we show this, uh, which even needs updating all the time. It's the audio ecosystem. These different colors of this hard-to-read slide represent different parts of the ecosystem, everything from the dynamic ad insertion technology, which allows you to, you know, with a push of a button, essentially change all of the ads, the sponsorship ads, all those ones about like Casper mattresses or Quip toothpastes or Me Undies or those things, uh, to change them through your whole back catalog, essentially, which is a great way to you know, increase your opportunity to monetize. 
So there's that. There's also the apps that are out there. There's so many different types of apps. Um, you know, there are so many different types of content creators, more podcasting networks showing. This ecosystem is just growing and then more money coming into it. So I, there's some research that comes out. The new research will come out uh, in March. Um, it's called the Infinite Dial. But using some of the, the, what we had in demographic information, I just want to give you some like who's listening to podcasts kind of table setting. So if you look over on the left side, that's the US population ages 12 plus, And on the right hand side is the podcast listeners. So we know that about 32% of the American public, when they surveyed them by last March, had listened to a podcast in the last month. Um, and so you see that there's like a, it skews as younger, both in terms of the first two, the 18 to 34 year old, and then 35 to 54 year old, and a little less on the sort of older um, range, which is you know, basically what we would say about a lot of technology. Gender split, 52% men, 48% uh, women. So I think that also tracks, actually tracks uh, with what public radio sees a lot too. Uh, and then this is the one that I always, especially when I'm talking to public radio stations, because I know uh, firsthand how hard public radio has worked over the years to attract a more, a less white audience. Actually, a lot of public radio audience is like 90% white, and people keep working at this and, and not really succeeding, quite frankly. Um, but you look here, here on the left, you see the population, the race and ethnicity of the American population, and on the right, the race and ethnic breakdown of who's listening to podcasts. And when I saw this, this is from November 2018. It needs to be updated, but I was like, wow, that is the first time I saw something in media that so seemed to represent um, what we have in terms of our uh, race and ethnic composition in the United States. Um, I, when I look at this, I think also I look through the whole world as a white middle-aged lady now, and I also realize that I'm uh, you know, public radio focused, journalist focused, so I don't know exactly what people are listening to here. You know, I know that there are lots of different types of podcasts, but I always think like it's, a, it's great when there are many entry points, like people learning that they like podcasting and finding space for that. When we find the research also shows that once people start listening to podcasts, once you become like a weekly listener, you're listening to five to seven podcasts a week. So it actually feels to me like it becomes habitual like pretty quickly. Like you're, whether it's gonna be you're walking the dog or whether you're working out or cleaning the house or something, if you kind of like that experience of having that intimacy and something happening, like you're gonna want more of it. So that's good news for all of us who wanna make podcasts. Like there's, there's room. I still believe, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Is that you? <laughs> Lindsay usually keeps me on time. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so this, uh, how to listen, these are just a, like a selection of many of the apps. I'm gonna point out two kind of biggies for you. Spotify, you know, has made a really big play in podcasting. They just, they, you know, they bought Gimlet, they bought The Ringer, like they just announced that a couple weeks ago. They bought Anchor, which is a, a really easy to use, uh, like phone-based, you know, like you can make your podcast and distribute it all through your phone. Um, they've been making some really big purchases and they're really trying to get like significant in podcasting, which is, you know, which is cool because it's a uh, very global and stuff, but and we're very committed to an open ecosystem and one thing Spotify is not is an open ecosystem. So, you know, I think there's, I hope that there's gonna be continuing to room, room for a lot. The other right next to it is YouTube. We've been working closely with Google on this international training program. We know that actually YouTube, more podcasters are using YouTube. A lot of people are accessing lots of free content on YouTube, so it makes some sense. The purists among us do not consider YouTube to necessarily be a podcast platform, but I think those of us who are more strategic, like you should probably be considering a YouTube strategy as you plan your podcast, even if it's just posting your audio with a still image, because people are going there. It's gonna happen more and more. This is just some of the top podcasts because it's kind of fun to look at these lists and I'm always very heartened. You see the daily and up first are always kind of vying for actually, well, the daily is always number one basically, but, but you look at that NPR News Now, that's the, um, the hourly newscast, one of my favorite listens, honestly, no joke. Uh, but you see a lot of news in here actually, which I'm always sort of heartened as we think of like Trump fatigue and other ways that people are stopping to get their news. But I think people are getting more controlled about it. You also see some sports here. Um, you see some politics, you know, the kind of um, usual suspects. Um, this is a list of like the top 10 podcasts of last year. A uh, lot of Wondery, which is it's a lot of true crime, a little bit salacious. I feel a little bit cinematic in their way that they present their stuff. It's a, it can be quite riveting. Um, we have been told by a colleague, be careful of watching Man in the Window. It's so scary. She slept with the lights on for like three weeks. So if that's your thing, that one's for you. Um, but you see uh, comedy, you know, I think we're starting to see, we, it's very, you can take a snapshot at any given time and say these are the top podcasts. I can't yet uh, make 
like any uh, broad, like we know true crime works because like, I always think narratively true crime works because what higher stakes could exist than murder? Like that is where narratively interesting. Um, but I, yeah, otherwise it's very hard to. I was in Egypt teaching podcasting and I tried to spend one night trying to describe what podcasting was by talking about different podcasts. And slowly I was like, wait, this is like trying to describe what television is by telling you it's on at like eight o'clock each night. It's like, it doesn't really work. So um, there's just a lot of podcasts out there. Remember, if you like anything at all, if you've ever linked anything, there's a podcast about it. It's going to go deep for you. We made a list of some uh, academic podcasts knowing that we'd be speaking with you today. Some of these are really remarkable. Uh, many of them are really remarkable. I think each one of these ones that we've listed up here, uh, from the Science of Happiness to Seen on Radio, which comes from the Duke Center for Documentary Studies, and they're doing a big series on democracy now. Um, after they also did like Seeing White, which I thought was really great, and Men, they called it Men. I wondered if sometimes if they should call it like Men, you know. <laughs> um, but they did like deep things. Uh, what Trump can teach us about con law, great idea. They actually just basically every week say, Trump did this, can he? And, uh, and that's, you know, sort of like this. They, so far they haven't run out of material, uh, so <laughs> that's pretty exciting. Um, so there's like a lot of, uh, there's some things here from uh, University of Chicago, We've got uh, uh, Bush Institute, right, with Ladies First, about first ladies. Um, so like, there's different ways. I think each of these, you know, as you might get into the space, making sure that you're listening to your competition, basically. Like, how are they telling these stories in a way that makes it compelling? Are they? Are they not? Where do they fail? Um, OK, and over to you, Anne, finally. <laughs> working? Mic working? Yes, hi. Uh, how many of you are here from the sciences, thinking of doing science podcasting? Um, so I got a call early on, maybe 10, 12 years ago, from Cell, the journal, Cell, the microbiology journal that you all read, because it's a page turner, and they wanted to do a podcast. And I went over and talked about characters and drama and audio quality and all of these things. And they were all looking at me blankly. And then I realized they wanted to learn how to put a microphone up to their mouth and read the journal Cell. So while they're in the lab, they can be listening to these journal articles while they're physically doing some other thing. So that's how it started. And then they really branched out and got creative. And they started doing interviews in their cell thing. And this is a sample. Water filtration and purification methods use chemicals and filters, such as ozone gas or ultraviolet light, to render water safe to drink. Proponents of the raw water movement contend that these purification processes pollute tap water with all sorts of undesirable additives and remove beneficial probiotics and minerals. They advocate drinking so-called pure spring water. So if you're looking, if you've got insomnia, this is what you want to listen to to help you go to sleep, okay? So fast forward several years later, I'm driving across country with my son and we decide to find a podcast that he had heard about called Sawbones. Has anybody listened to Sawbones? So it's a medical doctor who teaches, uh, I think it's at West Virginia University, teaches history of medicine. And um, her husband is a comedian. So she's finding these really weird, you know, leeches and ancient cures and whatever. And he's just riffing on the whole thing. So this one episode is about the woman who gave birth to rabbits. And it's a woman in 1800 or so at age 25. She goes into labor. She has a miscarriage. and continues to sh appear to be pregnant, and then delivers rabbits, and then continues to deliver more rabbits and more rabbits. And there's a midwife there, and then they call in the doctor, and then the king's court doctor comes because this is this medical phenomenon, and it goes on for months, and she keeps delivering animal parts. What happened is that after the miscarriage, like I said, she had gotten an accomplice, to because her cervix was still open at the time mm -hmm. to insert the body of a cat and the head of a rabbit into her uterus uh, she continued this with the aforementioned baby rabbits and various animal parts uh, by hiding them on her person she had she had sewn a special pocket into her skirt where she would hide them and then when people weren't looking she would insert them either into her if she couldn't into her uterus at that point into her vagina and then later than the doctor would deliver it from her vagina, not, you know, not looking to see how to come out of her uterus, assuming it had initially come out of her uterus, pulling it out of the vaginal cavity, and voila, she was giving birth to bunnies. Some challenge, challenging ideas, some challenging visual concepts on this episode of Sawbones. <laughs> Woof. So my question, my of hand, course... My, I'm sorry for the audio there. My hand was literally covering my mouth in utter terror. 
it, it is. It is awful, and it, it it may make you wonder why would someone ever do this? Oh yes. So, basically, for for reasons that seem sort of mundane in light of how crazy this story is, the fame, the money. Um, like I said, it, this was a time when if you had some sort of medical condition that made you appear un uncommon, you know, not not like most people, um, then you could make a lot of money off that living. And so she knew that, and this was Mary's play to try to support herself and have a better lifestyle and support her family was to be, you know, to join one of these kind of medical shows and let people come see her as the amazing woman who gave birth to bunnies. And that was the that was the plan. Yeah, I for mean the, for the money. Once you put the initial inv the work investment in, it's just dividends from there on out. I mean, maybe <laughs> you have to pop out a bunny once every couple of months, you know, just to keep the mystique alive. Well, well, what she what she was banking on, and what she turned out to be right about for a while, is that people were willing to believe this that that women when they were pregnant that first of all that were so willing to believe that whatever a woman does when she's pregnant is probably to blame for any any issues that a baby has that it, well it's probably mom's fault so because men are so eager to believe that anyway yeah they'll buy that i gave birth to a bunny because i dreamed about eating a bunny men will buy that and she was right many many men and i say men because the doctors who were attending her were men many men did buy that those bros <laughs> um so what's the difference between cell podcast and sawbones You all laughed in the second one. You did not laugh at the first one. Storytelling, humor, uh, having an engaging personality talking to you, somebody who's got some presence, who's there, um, and somebody you want in your ear or in your car or in your kitchen and with you all the time. So that's the, that's the voice that we want to hear is somebody. This carried me from California to New York. Uh, I don't know how many episodes we listened to, but it was pretty much a 12-hour day's driving to get my son to New York, and uh, off we went. So Sawbones is one of my faves. So if you are dull, <laughs> and most of us are, uh, get a good sidekick. Get some engaging guests on your podcast. Get people who are funny or dramatic or hysterical or crazy, but get a sidekick that will make it, make it sing. Um, so Boston University was really a leader in podcasting. In, 19, in 2006, we had a podcast academy. And if you read Hot Pod, does anybody here read Hot Pod? OK, forget it. Um, there was a new Podcast Academy coming out now. But we started Podcast Academy in 2006. And it was a bunch of white dudes with pocket protectors walking around with beanies spinning out of their hats and <laughs> nerding out. And they were having a great time. Um, at the end of the, the episode, the guy that started, Doug Kay, said, podcasting will just be a normal part of our life. It'll, and nobody believed him. He, nobody believed it would be this ubiquitous thing, but he was very confident that it would take off, and he was right. Um, so BU is now proudly the owner, or the alums are the owners of these two very famous podcasts, What the F with Mark Maron, and Bill Simmons has a sports podcast. Anybody listen to either of these? OK. So they are both BU folks. Um, and BU also has several homegrown podcasts, and I think some of the producers are here. We have Nick Diamond, who does the public health podcast, and uh, Free Associations. There's three public health professors that read journal articles, but they're actually also very funny, and they poke holes in the journal articles and sort of say, who paid for this study, and this doesn't make any sense, and why would anybody do this research? Um, so it's an engaging science podcast. And then there's somebody from the nutrition school. I don't know if they're here. Over there, hello. Hey. Uh, and she has this lovely thing called Spot On, which I'll play a little segment of to show you that it can be done in an engaging, fun way. What are some of the health benefits of drinking uh, coffee? Because finally, we have something that has ridiculous amount of health benefits. So help us out with this. There are so many health benefits of coffee, um, including decaf coffee. So that's mm. really important, I think, to point out that a lot of the research that I'm about to mention includes decaf coffee. Mm. So a lot of these studies are observational, mm -hmm. and they're large. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're never going to say that co drinking coffee replaces 
healthy habits, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Health, yeah, right. Okay. Right. So anyway, with that preface, right. I mean, I'll have to say that, um, you know, we drink so much coffee, we Americans, that it's the leading source of antioxidants in our diet. Okay. No way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Real, because, you know, when you think of antioxidants, you think of fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. When, when were you going to tell me that? Well, huh? I wanted to spring it on you, and I like to save some surprises. I mean, we've known each other a long time, so. Wow. You know. But you know something yeah. that makes a lot of sense. It does. Well, it's a plant. Right. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's a bean, coffee bean. Hello. So it's a plant, and we drink so much of it that, you know, it, it's a huge contributor. Wow. Yeah. So with that said, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing about antioxidants, if, if for anybody who doesn't know, it's there are a class of substances that protect our cells mm -hmm. against damage, you know, mm -hmm. everyday damage mm -hmm. um, that could lead to chronic diseases. It all, uh, coffee also has some B vitamins, some magnesium and some potassium. Okay. So a en very engaging personality. It was a conversation between two friends talking about something, but throw a little, you know, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So you've got a little science there but you're hearing it in a funny and engaging way. So these are WTBU, uh, the student radio station at BU, has several podcasts, different ones every semester. Um, some are really great, and some are really Mickey Mouse. Some have one episode, some have five or 10 episodes, depending on how motivated the student is. But um, if you're interested, we have several studios available to you, and um, you sign up at the beginning of each semester with your pitch for what your podcast will be, and we can make arrangements to get it produced and teach you that. Um, so we predicted the future about how successful podcasting would be, but my late, great, wonderful colleague, David Carr, who you all probably know from the New York Times, um, his last words to me were, no one is ever going to get rich in podcasting. And he said this in 2018. 2014. Before uh, the big moment. No. OK. Uh, I, I think it was after Serial. I think I got uh, the date wrong. Um, whoops. But the fact is, about a year ago, uh, Gimlet Media got bought up for what, $290 million? Dollars. So Alex Bloomberg from This American Life turned his little podcast company into this hugely successful, financially successful uh, business. So he's one guy. There's a few people out there that are doing the same thing. But um, if you have a brilliant idea and a great personality and a lot of humor, uh, you can make it sing. So there you go. Yes. All right. So key first decisions before you can make all of that money <laughs> or just spread amazing knowledge. We always say once you've defined your listener, because really that first step is figuring out who's going to be listening to your podcast. It's very important not to be like the woman in the New York Times and make it for yourself. It's also very important not to make it for everybody, but to think really specifically about who's going to be on the other end listening. Um, but then you need a good idea. Sounds so obvious. This is a lot more than just finding a really cool story about bunnies. Um, but it's figuring out, you know, what can we do that's different in this space that's going to make us distinctive and that's going to stand out to that listener who is, is going to have to come and seek us out and choose to listen to this show. An example we love to share is Bottom of the Map. It's a podcast out of WABE in Atlanta. WABE is a public radio station and they were doing a lot of focus groups and user research and what they heard over and over from young black members of the community was that, yeah, we've heard of WABE. It's an institution that we really respect, but there's nothing on this station that's for us. We don't listen. And so the team wanted at WABE wanted to figure out, like, is podcasting something we can use to reach this audience that isn't listening to our terrestrial station? And so they had had these two women appear on the station before. One is Dr. Regina Bradley, who is a historian of Southern culture and hip hop, and Christina Lee, who is a music journalist. And they knew that they had great rapport, that they could talk just really intelligently about hip hop and its place in American culture. Um, I looked at the competitive landscape. There are a lot of hip hop um, podcasts that are already out there that go from kind of light, light conversation, smoking weed, making jokes, to like really critical conversation. But one really important thing they noticed is that all of these shows were from New York City, one from the Bay Area. The South's perspective was completely missing, and anybody who knows hip hop knows that that's an extremely important contribution to hip hop. And so they brought on um, Christina and Regina to host this chat cast where they're going deep into like the history of trap and all different topics that you aren't going to hear on the radio station but that are reaching a new group of listeners, and they had some really great promotional photos and billboards, too. 
Um, so we worked with them last year as part of our public training, radio training program, Project Catapult, and we're really proud of what they accomplished. All right, then you need to decide on format. So what is the best way to structure your podcast? Um, you can have a chat cast, right? Conversations that are really just you and some friends or colleagues talking. You can have an interview. So this can be either scripted, a show like Death, Sex, and Money, one of my favorites, where the host, Anna Sale, interviews a different person, sometimes celebrities, some more everyday people. Um, but you know, it's a very long interview of which she plays snippets and then does a lot of narration over it. You may have something non-scripted like WTF with Mark Marin, or it's really just a long conversation. Um, narrative nonfiction is really the big one. That's like serial and all the things that came after it. Ear Hustle is in there too. And then you can have narrative fiction. And that's um, both aimed at adults and at children. Timestorm is um, a team that we worked with through the Google program. And it's about a pair of twins living in New Jersey who travel back in time to learn about their Puerto Rican heritage and history. It's great. I recommend it. I took out my daily impeachment pod slide, which was a funny joke for a few months. But um, <laughs> you do have these little pop-ups of things that happen when they're topical. Um, so once you figured out what kind of show you're making, you need to figure out how often it will be released. You figure out what type of show first, because that's really going to determine how much work is going to go into it and how often you're going to be able to get new episodes out. It's super important to be consistent. Um, that is for building audience. If you have long gaps between episodes or just are dropping episodes at random times, that's hard for people to follow. Like I know on Mondays I want to listen to This American on Life, and every other Friday I'm ready for the new episode of Criminal. And if it's coming out at a different time where it's not there, I get angry. I really do. Um, sponsors also really value consistency and frequency, obviously. They'd like to get in the listeners' ears as often as possible. Um, and so that point about production demands, how much work does your show involve, it's a lot easier to release a weekly chat cast than it is to release a weekly serial or a show like it. We point to a show like S-Town. Did anyone listen to that? Yeah. It was amazing. It was six episodes, right? And it took three years to produce. So it's something to think about. And then just from a technical standpoint, feed updates. If you're inconsistent, and especially if you're inactive for a long time, your subscribers won't get updates when a new episode is released. So that's why a lot of shows, even if they have seasons and then go on hiatus, you'll see them putting out like bonus mini episodes or trailers or even letting another show use their feed for a little bit to gain audience, because that helps them as well. And then decide on length. Um, my colleague Mark liked to say that however, short, however long you think your podcast, like whenever you think it's short enough, it should actually be shorter than that. Um, we're big believers in discipline and editing. There are some obvious exceptions to this, shows like Hardcore History that just go on forever. Um, but as there are more and more shows coming up and people you know, dividing their listening attention, getting like, down to the point and focusing what you're doing can really help. Um, and we like to say like, a lot of shows, they end up being in that 20 to 30 minute range, around like, the average length of an American commute. But again, you're thinking about your listener and the audience. And that could determine the length. Maybe it's somebody who's in the lab all day and wants to hear a whole journal article. Or maybe you're the team at Louisville Public Radio, who we also worked with. They made a show that's a um, music education podcast for children. And it turns out that children's attention span peaks at like five to seven minutes. And that's how long their show is. Any longer, they're going to lose their audience. And they, can, they pack a lot if you really want to learn about rhythm and pitch and all of that. Adults can enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what's in a name? You want it to be clear. You want it to be descriptive and memorable. It should work with a logo. It should be smart speaker friendly. You want it to be really easy if someone says it out loud, as more and more people are listening on smart speakers, that'll be able to pick it up. So something complicated. We had a team. First, they were called churchy, because they were kind of about the like discussing faith, but not from any like denominational perspective. Then they were like, they didn't want it to be about church, because then it was like too much like Christianity. So they came back and they were like, we're gonna be religious. <laughs> Which like looked really good on a slide, did not work as well when they tried to record a pilot. Um, this is another show we worked on thinking about names. They came in, this is the show from um, Colorado Public Radio, and they had this idea that what was gonna make them stand out is that, you know, Colorado is kind of five years ahead of the rest of the country in marijuana legalization. 
but everyone else is catching up. And so like, what can they teach the rest of us about like, the good, the bad, all the legal intricacies, everything else about marijuana legalization? Um, they came in with the name, The Cannabis Tales. Kelly remains I'm the only fan a big that. fan of that one. <laughs> yeah, the Berry Tales, I like it. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. Um, but it was really important, you know, they wanted to come with this public radio sensibility where we're not like too much on one side or the other, but they want to be engaging. Most people didn't find it that way. A really fun part of our 20-week programs is that every month teams come back and they kind of re-pitch their show to everyone. So after a month, this team came back and they were no longer the Cannabis Tales, they were Sticky, which more fun name, a little bit more engaging, but also very insidery. All of a sudden, it seems to maybe have a little bit of a perspective and it was important to them that they weren't like falling on like we're a show where we're smoking pot and talking about how great it is although the pilot does have the host Anne Maria Wad walking into a dispensary and buying weed so that's a little unusual for public radio but they also didn't want to be on the you know very clinical side so their third attempt they went with on something um, a little bit tongue-in-cheek a little bit of a wink at the listener but still you know might reference on being you might think about um, and that's the one that stuck for them. Um, life after legalization, they changed their tagline as well. And then just one more thing, you're going to probably want music in your podcast. There are a lot of places where you can go online to find music that's either free or cheap. Yeah, take a picture of that one. Another great one is if you know somebody who, who is great at making music, like see if they can help you out. We have a lot of teams that find music that way. I'll give you a sec. <laughs> This is the important resources right here. <laughs> All right. So moving on to thinking like a publisher. A thing we talk about a lot when we talk about podcasting is that it's not enough to just make a good show and put it out there. You need to kind of think about the whole picture of what you're doing. Because there are a lot of people who are putting out content. The ones who are successful are really thinking about how to market it how they're going to work with the team, how they're going to sustain it over time, even if they're not making money, which especially at the beginning, but maybe not ever, you're probably not going to be pulling in a ton. How are you going to make sure that you have the resources you need to keep going? Um, so I'm just going to play this quick video. This is from our Podcasting 101 series that Carrie mentioned. We had two amazing hosts for this show. One was Sean Ramsworm, who is the host of Vox's Today Explained podcast, the daily news show. And then we had Lovia Ajayi, who's the host of some really popular chat casts, some Jesus and Jolliffe, and then a show she does called Rants and Randomness. So they came and they helped us out. I like this episode a lot because it explains some things like that RSS feed that we keep referencing. And just like you have that podcast, how do you get it out into the world? <laughs> Welcome back to Podcasting 101, the video series brought to you by Google Podcasts and PRX. Love it here to tell you how to get your podcast out into the world. So you've done all the work, you made your show. Where does this thing go and how do folks hear it? Well, first, you're gonna have to work out a place to host your podcast. A place where you upload your audio so it shows up in podcast directories like Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. This is sort of like the podcast version of uploading a video to YouTube. Because podcasts are an open technology, they rely on something called RSS feeds. This is what makes podcasts different from radio. The RSS feed gives your podcast limitless reach all over the internet. And these RSS feeds contain information about your show, such as the title, the author, and the cover art. Podcast platforms use this information to let people know about your podcast. And audio hosting services are the ones that create and manage the RSS feed for you. Now here's a quick checklist of other things to consider when choosing a hosting service. Number one, cost. You'll have to pay monthly to host your show to keep it available to listeners. Each company's pricing is different, so find something that fits in your budget. Number two, how do you know how well you're doing? You need to know your metrics. There's a difference between knowing someone listened to your podcast somewhere versus knowing 400 people listened on Sunday with an Android in Lagos. Shout out to my Nija peoples, okay? Mm -hmm. And then number three, control. If you decide to change your hosting service in the future, you do not want any interruption to your distribution. So make sure your hosting service allows you to take your RSS feed with you. Check out the link in the episode description for more information on different types of hosting services. One more thing to think about. The first time you submit your podcast to a platform like Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, 
it can take a week or more to appear in the app. So make sure you're building some time to get approved. And a pro tip here, make a short trailer for your show. By short, I mean a minute or two. Say what the show is and what people can expect when they listen, and then upload that to your audio host to get your RSS feed approved, okay? Boom, there you go, your show's out there. The world will be able to find it and subscribe, so shout out to you. On the next episode, it's gonna be all about getting the word out about your podcast. I'm gonna give you the lowdown on how to reach your audience. So, look forward to seeing you there. That's a little covered, but um, we also have the web address on these resource sheets that we have printed out that you can take, but googlecp.prx.org. We have 10 of these videos. Really, I don't know why we keep doing these talks, because they <laughs> represent the best of what we know with better jokes. Um, <laughs> Also to that point, I just was reading this morning that Spotify is changing their podcast pages so that now the trailer is like kind of up right underneath a show title, um, which is great because people can go to a show and right away get a sense of what it's going to sound like. Um, but another really important reason why you might want to have a trailer for your show. A really good one. A really good one, yeah. All right, so she talked a little bit about choosing a hosting platform. And if you go to that website, we have a lot more information about your different options and what they offer. Um, as Lovey mentioned, um, one thing to consider is cost. Another is metrics. What kind of information are, is that platform going to give you about your listeners? Control, how much control do you have over your RSS feed if you want to move? Um, and monetization, does it allow you to do dynamic ad insertion, for example? I'm going to skip the making money video. Um, I'm such a teaser. I want you all to go and watch it. But um, a few things to think about just when you're making a budget for your show. Um, you have to think about staffing. It's probably not going to be just you and a mic. It could be, but if you're going to bring on somebody to help with music or with editing to make it sound really great, it's going to be an expense. Um, recording equipment. I like to say that you can make a podcast on your phone. You can record right into it. There are even programs where you can edit on your phone, but you're probably going to want to level up a little bit even if it's just like getting an external mic to plug into your phone. And at the end, we'll talk about some resources that PRX and BU has so that you can even get a little more technologically advanced than that. Audio editing software, again, these vary from the free things that come on your computer to programs that give you a lot more options to play around. Storage, where are you going to keep all of those audio files that you've collected, those very long interviews that you're then editing down? Please don't lose them. Studio time, if you're going to be using a studio. Podcast hosting, again. Website hosting, really important to have a website that you can direct people to for your show. It should probably be different than like, maybe it will live on a BU website or your department's website, but it's good to have a standalone place as well that people can go to. Um, and then marketing, getting the word out. And music rights and clearance. I would. Check out those places we recommended first. Um, a show like Bottom of the Map that's playing hip hop songs, um, they're trying to like stay within fair use. It's a little bit messy. We don't even have great answers for like what music you're allowed to play. They're like using fair use and saying like under 15 seconds when we're talking about it in critical conversation is okay, but it's a little bit of the Wild West out there when it comes to music rights. And then you also want to think about, again, how are you going to sustain your show beyond just getting a few episodes out? Um, so one thing to think about is how big your audience is going to be. You might have one of those really, really niche audiences. Um, is it the Iowa, the Idaho Potato Society? Yeah. They have a show. Eye on potatoes. Eye on potatoes. <laughs> um, might be a little bit more of a limited audience than, say, a cereal. Um, that can be okay. If you have a really big audience, you might be able to get like that MeUndies money. But typically, we like to say that's like 100,000 listeners per episode. That's a lot of people. If you have a more targeted audience, there might be a way to work with sponsors who really want to reach those listeners specifically. Like the Fry Later company. Yeah. Yeah, I on yeah. potatoes, right? <laughs> Maybe Monsanto. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yes, thinking about other ways to monetize as well. Live events right now are a really big way that podcasts, we talked before about how they build and deepen communities. And there's a show called My Favorite Murder. It's a chat cast with two comedians basically reading the Wikipedia pages of famous murder cases and making a lot of jokes. 
Um, they get the facts wrong all the time, but people love them. Their tagline is, stay sexy, don't get murdered. Their fans <laughs> call themselves the Murderinos, and they like turn up for events. They'll pay over $100 for tickets. They will sell out giant venues around the country. Um, even a show like A Shout of Boston, um, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Has anyone listened to that one? Yeah, their show about Harry Potter and religion. We were at the Oberon a few months ago, and they had a packed house for people who just wanted to come see them. Were you there? It was a great show. It was really fun. They're funny. They're engaging. Um, yeah, so a lot of different things you can think about. Um, partnerships. Maybe who can you work with to help make this happen, right? Within Boston University or perhaps somewhere else. We talked to a lot of people who, you know, like foundations and they're people who kind of want to get a message out or kind of, you know, represent their institution and they're trying to figure out like how on top of all the other duties we have can we also produce a podcast and we're always like, what if you found a podcast that's already out there or trying to be out there with people who really know what they're doing and you underwrite them, right? Or like work with them to help put something out that's aligned with your values instead of trying to do something yourself. Um, so there may be someone out there who wants to work with you on your show or there may be a way that you can help someone who's producing something. Um, metrics, again, that's like really knowing your audience, who they are, how they're listening to help you target the way that you're trying to reach them. Um, talked about sponsorship a little bit. All right, next section. <laughs> so you've been invited to guest on a podcast. Anyone been invited to guest on a podcast here? Oh, how was it? Can someone just tell me how it went? Yeah, right here. Great. It was great? Yeah, it was, uh, um, he had all the equipment we recorded in, the, uh, in a church basement. So, um, what was the show? Oh, uh, Unreliable Narrator Theater Group Podcast. <laughs> I have never heard of that one. Did you check it out? <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone had a terrible experience appearing on a podcast? Or just like an OK one? No? No one just like heard their own voice and was like, oh no, that's what I sound like? That'll be me if I watch this yeah. video later. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I talked to my colleagues. Her name is Stephanie Quo, and she has a podcast called Racist Sandwich, which is all about the intersection of food and race and social justice. And she has guests on her show for every episode. And I'm like, Stephanie, what are you looking for in a good guest? What should people know? So she informed a lot of this. But first of all, just like to get an idea of the this is just the beginning of the wide variety of the kinds of podcasts that may be in search of experts. There's some that are you know, really focused, 99% invisible, is about design. If you're in Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, you'll have a lot of people in the clergy or else who are studying religion. Um, Hormonal is a podcast. We'll bring in people who can, researchers who can talk about women's health. Um, a lot of different places. So it's worth like looking around and seeing if there are podcasts that cover your specialty and even reaching out to them and pitching yourself as an expert on a certain topic. Um, so preparing for your interview. Um, identify what type of show you're appearing on. Stephanie told me that a lot of times people like won't really know what Racist Sandwich is and haven't done the research beforehand. So think back to those formats. Is it a chat cast? Is it going to be an interview where it's an hour long and you're really expected to carry that narrative? Or is it going to be a narrative show where they may use a few clips from you, but it's not going to be the whole time? Really important to know. Then you want to listen to the show. Listen to as many episodes as you can to get a sense of the hosts and the tone of the show. That's really important when you're thinking about like how are you going to come across, what stories are you going to tell, and what are you going to present. It's totally OK to ask what will be expected of you as well. You don't just have to guess. Most podcasts won't give you a list of questions ahead of time, but They'll work with you. Um, think about focusing your expertise. I'm like pretty sure everyone in this room knows a whole lot of things. But what is the one thing that you are trying to get across in this interview or conversation? How can you kind of narrow it down a little bit so that you don't overwhelm listeners? Um, Stephanie was telling me she did an interview this weekend. And it went so off track. And they had this amazing conversation about all kinds of stuff that now is not going to make it into the podcast because they ran out of time and was not relevant to what they were there to talk about. Um, you may get asked to do a pre-interview. So that's before you do the real deal where you're recording. Um, a podcaster might call you and just be trying to figure out how you sound on radio, on audio, not on radio. 
um, get a little bit, and they might be screening you to see if they want you to be a guest, or they might just be trying to figure out, like, oh, what are those moments where they're like really telling a compelling story or really sound excited about what they're doing, and that, when you get to the real interview, will shape the way that they go through their questions. And then finally, like, it is within your ability to sound really great. If you get invited to a studio where everything's set up and they're ready to go, that's amazing. A lot of times they may just want to do it over the phone or on Skype. You can like empower yourself to help them out, even by just recording yourself on your end with a phone or a small recorder. So you have the conversation. You're also recording yourself, speaking really close to the mic and clearly. And then you send them the file after. And then there's suddenly much better audio than that like breaking up sound over the phone. Then the day that you're recording, try to go somewhere quiet where there's not going to be background noise. Like being outside, being in a hallway, something like that, not going to cut it. Um, be personable. Like think of yourself as a character on this podcast. Um, really important. Think about like that storytelling and how powerful that is in audio. How can you tell stories that illustrate your points? And finally, like have fun. Podcasts are a lot of fun. There will probably be some editing afterwards, so it's a little different than being on the radio. And you have some opportunity to play. So we're going to play a, I think Spot On actually did this really well. But um, we're going to play another clip of um, an interview where the guest really got into that storytelling mode and came across as a compelling character. So you wrote a book called Indebted about the incredible burden that students and families are taking on and how that affects their education and their lives going forward. Tell me about that work, what you discovered, and how you came to it. I came to it because my students brought it to me. I work at NYU, uh, one of the most expensive universities in the country, yeah. and it kind of showed up again and again in my classroom, in my office. Students would come to me to tell me about the challenges that they were facing, both trying to get an education and carry the debt they took on for that education. And how does carrying that amount of debt <coughs> affect their educations and their lives going forward? It must be an enormous effect. It is an enormous effect. In part, they take on the, the debt because they participate in building a dream with their parents. They want to go to a school where they can really explore their interests, get to know what their talents are, to kind of figure out who their people are going to be in mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. But that is very, very expensive today, and it then puts limits on who they can become. I like that clip because you can tell the host, Adam Conover, who you must have have seen him on TV, he was like really prepared to start off, like, you know, tell me how you got interested in that. He was asking those good storytelling questions. But then the guest, who is a friend Kate of Kate Zaloom, uh, is the yeah. book Indebted that just came out. Uh, yeah, she was also prepared, like, with that story about why this research mattered to her, why she got interested in this story, and was able to tell it in a pretty compelling way. All right. We're going to just go through a little bit additional resources that both PRX and BU has to offer. Carrie, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Um, all right, so first off, we've already talked about the podcasting 101. Uh, there's also a companion course, which uh, we designed so that if you, like say, one of the things that we teach a lot is that if you're going to start this work, be prepared to you know, prototype and test it, like, and iterate, basically. We do, uh, actually, this Friday, if any of you would like to come to the podcast garage, there's parking. Um, we are having our teams, our public radio station teams, are arriving in Boston today. Tomorrow, we'll do a day of training with them. Then Friday morning, we serve breakfast, and then each of them has about six minutes where they pitch their podcast to a room full of people. They get verbal feedback from four panelists, and everyone in the room writes them feedback in the form of rose, thorn, bud, like, you know, what I liked, what I, the thorns are what I wish I saw, and the, um, the buds are like, I wonder if you try this kind of thing. They, this is maybe their third and final one before they have a big showcase, uh, which is going to be at the Oberon on March 17th. If any of you are like wondering what you'll do on St. Patrick's Day, um, you are invited to come see this. It's kind of interesting because actually we believe in this idea of getting a lot of feedback. So getting like a pilot test uh, group, like somebody that you can um, you know, give yourself room to experiment and, and just try stuff out. 
the companion course here will kind of help you over the 10 episodes. You know, there's like a, the companion course gives you a little quiz and it gives you an exercise to do, kind of building toward that ultimate moment so you can kind of walk you through that experience, walk you through kind of the same process that we use with our training. Um, there's also the Podcast Garage, so you're welcome to come anytime. We run workshops there on a regular basis. Some, one of my favorites is a, a podcast uh, class called uh, What the F is Narrative, run by Karen Given, who uh, works here for WBUR, um, and, does, and has been, she's hosting only a game now and has worked on that show for about 25 years ago. And she said, you know, I don't know, sometime in recent memory, they were going to move from what we call in radio like a magazine style show with lots of small pieces to something more narrative. She was like, hey, and actually, this is true for a lot of audio journalists, we, narrative is kind of where we live because it's very character driven by the fact of like a lot of the needs of audio listening. But she was like, wow, I have really no idea how to make narrative. So she really went on a broad exploration of like, you know, how do you actually do this? What does this mean? What kind of storytelling devices work and stuff? And so she's hilarious. It's a great class, a four-week class. But we have lots of like, uh, you can come and meet other makers. You can start to develop that community of people who will give you uh, real feedback about your work um, and encourage you. It can also be that you're going to meet that producer. Like if you have the body of knowledge, but you are daunted in any way, and understandably, by the hours it'll take to produce a really great sounding podcast. You know, there may be someone at the garage who's going to have that skill and just been kind of waiting for the good material. So, um, so we really encourage you. And the studio is lovely, and you can come. And uh, this isn't like a, it isn't really a hardcore sell here. Just to say that if you need the extra help of like some friendly people, making sure that the on button is working and like everything sounds great, the, the podcast garage is a terrific resource for that. You can of course actually make the, you know, you have. Access here at BU to studios. You know, people do make the podcast on their phone. You can like hide under your blankets and make really great audio. People, radio journalists have been doing this forever. It just gets a little hot after a while, and it's nice to have um, sunlight. You know, so uh, this podcast studio helps. Uh, here's our classroom. So um, finding you know a place you can come and learn. Oh yeah, and then the gathering, the community part of it. Those are the key things that we say we do at the podcast garage. But there are more. There's some really good books that are out recently too. I don't think we have a. We have some in the hands. Yeah, some of the slides right there's a uh, Eric Newsom who was part of the team that started Invisibilia has a book called Make Noise about podcasting. And my favorite is Kristen Meisner who does a podcast called By the Book and has a new book out called How to Be Fine. Um, she has a podcast it's like So You Want to Start a Podcast. A really warm lovely kind of step-by-step -step introduction. One of my favorite things about working in audio, my whole career has been how generous the community is, especially when it comes to technical information. So there are a lot of resources out there for you. You shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel, especially when there are 800,000 other wheels out there. So uh, be sure to get some uh, advice along the way. Um, we also have some upcoming events, which I like mentioned, uh, the Maker Mingle, um, that is tomorrow night. That's a chance to meet those people who might help you. Uh, you are welcome to come to our creative review. That's on uh, Friday morning. Uh, we really do feed everyone breakfast. Um, there's an audio production study hall. You can bring works that you're on. It, Heidi Shin uh, does this really terrific workshop about intimate interviewing, particularly if you are uh, interviewing um, people who don't necessarily look like you or have the same background, like how to get that intimacy and, and uh, really re approach people. And then the introduction to podcast scoring, a four-week workshop, which is, I've been teaching beginner journalists for a really long time, and one of the most significantly like stylistic differences is the use of music in narrative, really for pacing and storytelling and reflection. Like This American Life is kind of famous for doing like action, action, reflection. And the reflection is usually cued by music, which gives you that moment, like a beat, literally a beat, for you to like take in what they've just conveyed. Now that I've said this, you'll hear it all the time. Um, so, but figuring out that scoring, like when I was training as a young journalist, it was like you would never use music. It's emotionally manipulative. And then it's like, but if you work in narrative, you actually want to use this as one of the storytelling tools. Um, much like you'll be using your voice, which is one of the greatest things about audio in general. The inflection, the warmth, the, like just the engaging way that the voice can be to really pull someone in and like keep them um, listening to you is really critical. That's the event on March 17th. I, there's never been, thank you all for being here so that I could actually try pitching PRX things. So I, <laughs> I didn't really mean to sound quite so pitchy, but this will be a fun night. And I think the tickets are a whopping $10. So it's at the Oberon and we have free drinks after. So um, yep, do you want to talk about the, the sure. BU resources? Um, just a couple of things. I, I, I want to go back to what you said about you don't need a formal studio. And I can tell you my favorite makeshift studio was in it with John Rudolph in Cairo. The Cairo Hilton with no air conditioning, because if you turn the air conditioning on, it smelled like the sewerage in the Nile. 
underneath two lamps with the bedspreads <laughs> over us, and that was our <laughs> studio. So you can make a studio no matter where you are, padded cell, laundry closet, whatever it is. <laughs> um, but we have nice studios across the street at the Com. Um, there are two podcast studios. One is available to just Com students. The other is available for outsiders. I believe that's where the nutrition podcast is done. And then WTBU has this unbelievable, beautiful, state-of-the-art studio. Uh, we went down, Howard, Howard Stern is an alum, so we went down to his studios, and his engineers helped design our brand new studio up here. So it's lovely. Um, so you can, you can sign up for that as a WTBU podcast with WTBU. Um, and then almost, and there's one on the Med Campus, which is where Nick does his. It's the BU Godly Studio, and there's a sign-up thing over there. And almost everybody on campus has free access to Adobe Audition software, which you will need to cut down the audio after your two-hour-long interview and you really want a 20-minute podcast. Uh, that razor blade, electronic razor blade, is going to come in very handy. So that's, I think, available to most people on campus. So check that out. Um, any others? On yeah, there? That is our formal talk, but... Now it's time for your questions. questions so. Yes, a thank you and questions. Yeah. You are so ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. You had a question? Yeah. Do we need to mic? Yeah. The, yeah. Sorry. Is this working okay? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, hi. Thanks so much to the three of you. This was great. Um, I have two questions. One is circling back to your comment about adding podcasts to YouTube. What is best practice for that? Is it using audio with a still image, or where do you see that going? I think you're seeing it in two directions. The first one is kind of the one, it's, it's hard enough. Like, once you get that podcast out, like, you know, making sure the art is good, that the description is really compelling, like all of the, you know, that you're then going to post it on social media far and wide, like doing that extra work to get it into YouTube. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say if you can get the audio up there with a still image, make sure the description's good and your SEO, like your search engine optimization is good. That's great. If you can do more than that, it seems like the other thing people are doing is making kind of compelling clips of the video. Um, we're going to be, we're building a new podcast garage in Washington, D.C., and we're going to install video capability there. Many of the studios are getting to have video capability now, so you could actually put a video of your recording the podcast. I actually, I don't totally see the appeal of this, but I see my 14-year-old daughter, her, yeah. like, watch TV, like, on her phone everywhere in the world, and she's certainly been, YouTube is really targeted for tween girls, and they, both of my daughters just, like, whew, they listen to it all the time. So I think you can do that. Joe Rogan is, you know, has a really long podcast, and he's making a whole thing of, like, a channel of shorts, you know, specific clips. Um, so I think there's two things, but I, I always want to be mindful of the amount of work it's going to take to make a good podcast. I think you want to be really strategic about your secondary work that you do to get it out in the world. And for me, most of that YouTube work is secondary work. So do like hit the bar, but try you know like figure out what's going to work for your audience too. So. Great, thank you. My second question is about um, frequency, and you had mentioned that if you don't publish frequently enough, sometimes you'll lose that RSS feed. What does that timeline look like? Is it not publishing in three months? Like, what is that? I think that that's, like, I, I think it varies by your, which app your you're host, using, yeah. actually, and where it's hosted. Um, so I think that our general recommendation, this is actually one I kind of struggle against, because there are so many good short-form serialized podcasts now. And there's, you know, they're like kind of my favorite in a way. But PRX, you know, really will say that in order to build an audience and attract sponsors, frequency is your most significant thing. So figuring a way, like minimum of every other week, is really the way that you're going to build audience. So that could mean that you're going to build up, you know, a, like a stockpile of episodes before you launch, and like kind of give yourself a running start into it, which is something that we recommend. Um, Sarah Koenig didn't do when she did Sarah. Yes, <laughs> Sarah Koenig, you really got to God love her because she goes out there. There was one episode yeah. that was like a 40-minute interview with some DA, it's like clearly they had no production values in that one, but they needed to yeah. post it. Yeah. Well, no, and then she's been mid-season, and she's like, we've been weekly, but now we're going every other week, you know, clearly buying themselves sometimes. So you see, actually, like, some of the biggest names kind of sorting out this frequency um, problem. 
If you're going to go, like, if you're going to do that seasonal production, I really think, and here's where you really might have an advantage being part of an institution. You know, you're going to find, need to find other ways to reach your listener over time. So whether it's a newsletter, whether it's, you know, a strong social media presence, something in which the podcast is one element of what you're doing, so that when you come back into production, you can really make an event out of that. You know, that could be a nice thing. It's like, here's season two of what we're doing. Make sure you get press around it. You know, do whatever you can to, like, hype up that newness of it. I think that that can be, I think that can get you the audience. I think you're going to struggle a bit in the way that monetization sort of works in this industry to get people to fund it if it's irregular or if it's really limited or you haven't yet demonstrated audience. So you're, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, frankly. So. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so Hang on, we got a mic coming. Oh, yep, yeah. this just in. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, so if monetization is a harder goal to, to achieve, what is reasonable for listenership? And, you know, 17 million is serial. That's the high bar. Yeah, right. um, and I guess the woman who you showed, I don't know what the low bar is. but <laughs> Zero. I don't yeah. even think you can find her podcast. So I did find something called the Advice Podcast, and episode two was called Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, wow. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I say that people, when you ask people how many downloads they have, um, you know, it's kind of like asking people about their weight, like they will lie, uh, basically. <laughs> and one of the tricks is not t entirely their fault because how we measure, like at PRX, we're really concerned about listens, which is literally like, what do you know about when someone actually listened? Because downloads can be the number, that's actually the common number people use, but it's a little bit deceptive. My phone is downloading, oh, probably 50 podcasts a week now because I have so many in my app, but I don't always, I really don't always listen to all of them. Um, so it's, that's a bit of a false metric. It's kind of like a page views, you know, in terms of like unique views. So I think we work with a lot of, I would, we actually have our kind of a category that our teams are in, um, and we love them, but it's like under 50,000 downloads per episode. It's kind of the our beginning stage podcasters. Some of the biggest ones, you know, have, you know, the daily, what do they say, they have 20 million listeners or something. So um, I think when you're looking at it, you can, you know, like many things, just kill yourself with envy and assume that everyone else has more de listeners than you do. And I think there you really want to start to figure out how to engage with your listener and get feedback from them. Like give yourself some way to kind of like ping them and get something back so that, you know, maybe you are going to hit 3,000 people. But if you hit the right 3,000 people, like that can actually be more successful than hitting 30,000 people with kind of, uh, you know, kind of content. So One of the earliest podcasts that I heard about was Grape Radio. Do you know this? Oh, no. These were four guys that sat around and drank wine every Friday afternoon and talked about the wine. And then the wine industry said, we want to put our wine, give you our wine. So then they started getting free wine. And then they said, we want more than that. We want some money to pay for our time. And at least the one leader of the pack quit his day job. And they just got drunk every Friday afternoon. Yeah. What is wrong with this picture? I know. There's a podcast I called... I don't know if yeah. it still exists, but this was No, it's a back. great idea. There's another podcast called Whiskey Cats, where they talk about their cats and whiskey. That's like it. So they yeah. ran French to whiskey cocktails in season two, you know. But right. yeah, <laughs> great monetization options. So. Other questions? Oh, uh, you yeah. want to go here? Wait, the mic. mic over here? Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. We'll get to you. <laughs> so I was thinking back to the uh, slide that you had that was cell versus um, sawbones, um, and then you showed the differences between the two of them. And obviously, you know, sawbones has McElroy power, so it's funnier and stuff. But the other difference that wasn't on the slide was that um, they were clearly intended for different audiences. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm wondering is if you are, say, interested in doing an academic or, you know, podcast that maybe has an audience more intended to be specialists, how can you, you know, make, make it dynamic and engaging but without going full-on comedy? You know, I think who's doing the delivery? I mean, if the person has an engaging voice and a nice cadence and a little bit of levity to it, just re them talking about, if you listen to the um, SPH3 guys that are doing, the, they're basically talking about journal articles at a high level that I don't understand, but it's engaging enough that I can get the gist of it. So maybe having two people versus one, you know, if you're, again, the journal article just reading it cold is pretty deadly. But if you can get two people kind of riffing off of, isn't this interesting that they pursued it this way versus that way, and kind of, or arguing, like, this is really weird, and why did they do it that way, and somebody defending it. Um, some tension in there will be good. If the, if the two people that are talking are engaging, it'll help. Um, but, I, you know, I think there are people that just want to listen to the text of the journal article while they're sitting in the lab, and that saves them a ton of other time sitting down to read it 
while they're driving, whatever they want it, and it works for them. But most humans <laughs> want something that's a little more engaging. So I can add to that. The, I worked at Audible in the earliest days uh, when we were like making short form, downloadable, recurrent content. And one of our main products was like a you know, daily read of the Wall Street Journal, a daily read of the New York Times. We still have this uh, Scientific American. They were just straight reads. And one of the challenges is they're not they're written for the ear or the eye rather than the ear. And so it's hard to make pure text that's written to be read actually sound great. There's it's not uh, the main thing about writing for audio is to write the way we speak, you know. So, but I think there's a journalistic truism that counts in podcasting too, which is like try to find the compelling entry point in that big body of knowledge that you have. If you listen to the daily, one of the core things they do every day is they basically start with like, what's the flash of the new thing? Like, what's the what reason this is in the news today? And then they back up and they contextualize it, and then at the end they kind of push it forward. Sometimes we call this like an E structure. In terms of, that, and I would say like 90% of their episodes are in that structure. So even when you have like an academic talk, topic or you have something new, know that like the small detail or that pivot moment, the moment in which the research was found to be true or untrue or like there was a breakthrough, you know, maybe you think of starting your story there instead of thinking of having to start, you know, at the beginning and lead to that big moment. Like don't, don't ever hesitate in any on-demand thing from like going bold first. Like Terry Gross asks her best question first. Like she doesn't wait, doesn't like kind of build us up to it, doesn't assume that the listener has all the time in the world. So like pack a punch there. Like don't be afraid to make it compelling. And then you, once you've got people, then you can go lots of places. They will go so many places with you, but you gotta, and be a person, you know, be a real human being. Like, like if you love it, have passion for it. Like if this is the most compelling research you've read recently, like let them know why and like really go, you know, make it like, wow, this is like cool. Like I don't, I didn't know anything about this and now I know a lot about it. Or wow, this person, I really love the way they think about it. I love, this is what I'm studying all the time, but wow, this is like really meaningful for me. It makes my work better. Think about why your listeners coming and coming back to you. Yeah, I think structure, I actually had this conversation with Nick. Structure is really important, not going just yeah. in a chronological order. And I just happened to watch the movie a Brief Encounter last night. Anybody seen it? Good old black and white, lovely film. <laughs> uh, it starts at the end, yeah. and then it goes backwards. You know, there's this dramatic scene, but you don't really know what's going on. And then it goes backwards and comes back, this E structure. And you need to grab them early with enough good information that they're going to stay with you. Yeah. We have two questions over here, if we can use the mic. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, here, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, you've talked a lot about podcasts as standalone. Uh, can you talk maybe a little bit to it as an engagement strategy? So there's an app called 10% Happier mm -hmm. for meditation that I really like. And they have a podcast to engage their listeners that are separate from the meditations they're doing. Maybe that versus blogging versus newsletters versus. Is this related to Dan, whatever his name is, from ABC News? Oh, yeah. He wrote, Dan a, book Abrams, called, right. called, yeah. wrote a book called 10% right. Happier about Dan Harris, yeah. Dan Harris, yeah. Dan Harris, oh, Dan yeah. Harris sorry. Yeah. Boston. Yeah. Boston. Yeah. Boston. Um, so I, I have not listened to that podcast, so I don't know the reference. So the question is whether it's engaging, for, like promoting a product. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, promoting a product or en engaging the users of an organization or a product, mm -hmm. maybe comparing that to newsletters or blogs. There are all these different ways that you can yeah. do that. I think it depends on who those like core users are. Like, Are they people who already listen to podcasts and want audio content, maybe because they're listening to an audio app? Or are they like really active on Instagram and that's where, you know, they're keeping busy. Are there people who are reading new email newsletters? There are like easy ways where you can prototype and test that out maybe, or even just ask them, like, where do you get most of your information? Where do you go to find things out? Usually podcasts, you know, are not an engagement strategy on their own because it is still, you know, it's a, voice, a person who sounds like your friend. They're talking in your ear, but you can't always talk back unless the podcast has a strategy where they're asking listeners to write in or call in or come meet them on Instagram or somewhere else to have conversations about the content. So it's worth thinking about like how you want to engage with that audience and also just, it's really hard to get people to go to different places than they already are. So if you're already trying to drive them to an app or to a certain spot, um, a physical place or anywhere else, newsletters are great because they come right to their inbox and they're probably already there. Mm -hmm. If they're not listening to podcasts already, saying, hey, get my app and also listen to my podcast is going to be a lot of asks for them. 
Yeah, I think a podcast in like a 360 view sometimes, like depending on what your brand is, you know, like if you if you put a book out, um, you know, like, like can you, is there a podcast add on to that? But then like, you always have to make sure that somebody's going to find it, you know, like that's, you know, so you have, it's, it's an, enough work that you really want to make sure they can find it. Is it going to be enough work to support the other things that you're trying to do, whether it's, you know, an, part of an app experience or something else that you're doing? Our but. REI does a podcast called Dirtbag Diaries for Hikers. Oh. My husband listens to it. <laughs> okay. Um, and I don't know if the podcasters started it first and REI came to it or REI started it, but it's engaging for that crazy group of people that puts one foot in front of the other all day and they create a half hour podcast that people <laughs> want to listen to. So um, they've, they've grabbed their audience and they're not advertising REI products necessarily, but it is definitely in their wheelhouse and they, they talk enough that it sends people good vibes about REI. So um, as an advertising medium, I'm, that's up out of my wheelhouse completely. <laughs> so. Yeah, do you have a question next to you, yeah? Thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, um, you talked about being a good guest on a podcast, but I'm curious if any of you have good resources for uh, being a better host or asking better questions. Research. Very important. Being naturally curious. Mm -hmm. Don't just look at the list of questions in front of you. Just listen to what the person's saying and respond to it as a human would. Um, that's a traditional problem with my students is they go out with the five questions that they were supposed to ask and they come mm -hmm. back with the five answers. And the guy says, well, I murdered my wife in the middle of those five answers. And it's like, did you ask him about the murder of the wife? <laughs> no, forgot. So you got to barely be able to react to the other person and interrupt. If it's like you don't understand, assume that you're an intelligent person and your audience is probably at the same level of intelligence and just sort of say, if I don't get it, my audience doesn't get it. So stop them and say, can you walk me back with that and explain that a little bit more? I think those would help. Yeah, I'll add two things that... Um, First off, I haven't said this yet, but I like to say, if it, like, it took me a while to realize that Sarah Koenig is the main character of Serial. Mm -hmm. Like, it is her journey that you're following, whether it's whether Adnan Syed, you know, killed his girlfriend in high school, or whether the criminal justice system, you know, as represented in Cleveland, is a fair system. Like, she is on a quest to understand that. And so there's a kind of a core difference um, when you're like when you're a, when you're a reporter or just a really smart academic. You're doing a lot of research. You talk to people all the time. This, in fact, probably is something you think you're very good at. But a lot of times you're asking questions that you are going to somehow interpret for someone else. And when you are hosting something, you're you're. I mean, we always have said it's like you're the surrogate for the listener experience. You know. But if you actually think of yourself and your curiosity as the driving question and like the quest of the and the like narrative structure, then you. You really will structure your questions differently. Like really, again, think about like where's that key starting point, um, and then the, you how you frame those questions. I mean, you can edit yourself down, but like you know how you frame the questions actually really um, pivotal to like you know, kind of kick that off. You don't you do actually don't want to edit your questions that much. You want to get them kind of right, make them short, kind of push the story forward, kind of think about an arc. Terry Gross, uh, I love using Terry Gross because she's just like, you know, still the best inter interviewer. But you know, one of the points in which they do the most editing is in their list of questions before they get even into the studio, thinking about a narrative arc for the interview. And then they edit, it's one of the most heavily edited shows in public radio, which is always worth saying because one of the problems about podcasting, it sounds so easy, like because it sounds like a natural conversation and often the most edited sounds like the most natural conversation, which is very confusing because it takes a lot of time to make it sound that way, even though it would really be audible to like that work was not is hidden when it's well done. But you thinking about how you're gonna structure that um, is like a critical first step. Like how do I how do I wanna be on your journey as you learn about it? That's the role to think about. I think, I think of a tour four. guide sometimes. Yeah, you know, tour you're guide. taking me on a journey. Yeah. You're walking me through a place that I haven't been to before. Um, yeah. it's, it's Episode up. four of Podcasting 101. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about interviewing, yeah. Okay. It did, yeah. That like, gives you some really concrete tips. Huh. Any other questions? We're here all night. You got anything? We're <laughs> I'm curious what you guys, why you're here. Are you producing podcasts? Are you thinking of producing a podcast? Are you, you love listening to podcasts? Who produces? Produces? Anybody, anybody a producer? Nice. Oh, a bunch. I know we have a lot of people who have been guests on podcasts thinking about producing. Have a great idea. Yeah. Um, what, one thing I want to talk about a little bit, I'm looking at Bill Broadus who teaches film here. Mm -hmm. um, the Dirty John, does that ring a bell to people? Does anybody listen to that? It was an LA Times Magazine piece that then became a podcast that then became a Showtime serial drama. 
um, was a creepy guy, and you know nobody liked him. But um, but it was an interesting trajectory because I think if you've got an idea, you don't have to go whole hog into podcasting. You can start with something smaller and then say, hey, this has got legs. Let's try it here. And then if it's really good, you go to the Hollywood types and say, let's let's bring it to another level. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I've been making a joke with so many podcasts out there. Everyone who makes a podcast is really kind of desperate for content. So sometimes I'm like, okay, we should make no more new podcasts, and everyone should just help everyone make their podcast. So um, you might, I mean, it can be quite daunting to think about starting a podcast. You know, maybe there's another way that you're actually going to, that, that partnership that Lindsay was mentioning, like it's worth thinking about that too. And so. pitch yourself as a guest. People really need guests. Yeah, there are really whole like businesses and services online that just help you find guests for your podcast because it's hard to keep up that frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kristen Meinzer, I mentioned earlier about that. So you want to be a pod, you want so you want to make a podcast book, um, and she does the buy the book podcast. You know, which they live a self help book for two weeks, and like she and her comedian cohort talk about talk or companion talk about what happened to them while they lived the self help book. But she pitches herself. She told us she pitched herself last year to 150 podcasts, and she got booked on 100 of them with no like incense of like, reciprocity where she would then have to have them as a guest. But it was a really great promotion for her, and she's just very dogged about it. She would just like kind of write to them and say, I love you. She loves Dolly Parton as one of her deep verticals of knowledge, and so she would look for like every Dolly Parton podcast and say, like, I'd be a terrific guest. Like, do you need anyone? And you know, like she would find a really clever angle. She's just a good journalist, so she would pitch it, and she got on that, and it's great. Great publicity for her podcast. And that's, and that's good cross promotion for everybody, yes. right? Your podcast. If you're a guest on this person's and they're on yours, you've now got you've doubled your listenership potentially because you've now met people with like like-minded yeah. ideas. So. And if you're a guest, you can. Uh, they're a good podcast host, and if you are the host or you are the guest, they should ask you to be promoting the podcast in your their network. So another reason uh, I did have a, I have a good friend who was recently she's an ed specialist and she was on a podcast in which she was so she came to me later and she's like I was so excited to be asked but the audio quality is so bad I don't want to share it with anyone and I was like oh man that poor that podcast host really lost an opportunity um, to have my friend Maud like share it just by not doing a little bit of extra work to make her sound great um, so that she would then be proud of it I mean don't She's not even, she's not the fussiest, but most people would be pretty cool with whatever, but like you can think about how to engage them as part of the way that you spread the word um, and just do a little bit of extra. You know, if they just asked her to record on her iPhone, I know she could have managed that. So I was like, call me next time. I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah? How do, you oh, do we need the, sorry. Uh, so, questions how do you interview people remotely? Um, well, there's a couple different, I mean, being able to talk to them by phone. So if you are going to record on your iPhone, here's what you'll tell the person on the other end. Like you say, okay, turn your, put your phone into airplane mode, uh, get the voice recorder memo on the iPhone, but Androids also have memo apps. You're, you're going to talk to them on either another a phone, a landline, or you're going to talk to them over the computer. I mean, I think it's generally good to have a backup if you do this. So I would be on your end if you're the host. I'd be recording uh, whatever the phone tape to, just in case something goes wrong. But if you can sync up like a really clear sounding recording that the person's been doing on their end, you know, they you send the file that you can sync it up, and it sounds like you were in the same room oh. together. Basically, that's a, that the key is where they put that Skype. phone, right? If they put the oh, phone on their desk yeah. you know, and they're sitting yeah. back like this, you're not going to get much. You got to really instruct them. That's I mean, a key thing. And if you're, if you're on Skype with them and you can see them or Zoom with them, you can see that they you know, they put the phone down. Yeah, and you can hear it like this. So just say, hey, you got to bring that back up to your mouth. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you can put it on a stack of books, or like uh, sometimes I use a water bottle, you know, so it's kind of close there to my mouth when I'm talking. So um, yeah. Uh, we got a mic. Question. Hang on, we got yep. a mic coming. Oh, if you use Skype, you have to acknowledge that you use Skype. I don't really know how they've managed to do that for everyone, but it's one of those weird features. That's why on the radio, you're always like, oh, they connected to us by Skype. Skype. They have to say that. So. Hi. Um, on the similar note, if it's live. I mean, we've, you guys mentioned how live is becoming a popular way for podcasting. Like a live event, like the yeah. live events are becoming popular, yeah? Yeah, and then, of course, uh, streaming it on YouTube as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to work with someone remotely when it's that situation, I if it's even possible? likely to see that situation. Yeah. Okay. If you see people at a live event and they're either... You know, doing a show on stage and recording the audio for later, or maybe streaming it at the same time. They're going to want someone on stage with them or in the studio with them, right? Because it's kind of part of what people are watching for. 
Yeah. You're, you're too young to know who Ted Koppel was, but it was the green screen, right? Yeah. And the guest was 5,000 miles away, but they looked like they were right there. Um, that technology is all gone. You know, okay. we don't we don't do that anymore. So. Okay. That's but I want, I wonder if you could put a Zoom TV up next to your live event sure. and bring in yeah. somebody. You beam someone in. I don't know what the visual quality of that Zoom would look like on the yeah. on the YouTube, but. I mean, I've I've mostly seen where they pre-record or pre-interview a person and then they bring the interview at the moment. So I've seen that, but I was just curious if that's even yeah. possible. I think, I think live, your best yeah. bet is to be as live as possible and have your guests live, if at all possible. And then like you get, you know, the audience, once you get rolling, like they'll give you a lot more latitude if your questions, you know, like you're, it can be a little bit more uh, authentic with them actually. If you come so. to a show like um, the Catapult Showcase though, they, can, they have scripted stories that are really you know, written to be a live storytelling event. So they're taking you through a narrative and they will play recorded audio and then just kind of have a picture or th even the person talking up on a screen or maybe just some lines to indicate that this is audio that you're hearing. Yeah. And out of yeah. curiosity, um, Instagram just started monetizing Instagram stories. So I would imagine that they'll play around with podcasts eventually to, to compete with YouTube, really. Mm -hmm. So maybe you guys cool. will your yeah. slide. We have some, like we have one podcast we work with and they have built an amazing community on Instagram. They like post these old photos that like their core audience is really into. They have people like responding to them all the time. They're always doing like Instagram live events and they have a really hard time getting people from Instagram to go listen to their podcast, even though the Instagram is there to promote their podcast. It's like that <laughs> idea again, that it's really hard to get people to move from one platform. It's just way too It much. would be so great for them <laughs> if they could start putting their podcast right on Instagram. It's like, you know, oh, they're called long distance. They're about um, the Filipino diaspora and Filipino history. They're great. Great example just to look at what an amazing podcast Instagram looks like. And we've like, had a great show. Yeah. Listen yeah. to them. Yeah, it's really, really good. And like one last question, maybe, and then we can we'll stay here to answer questions individually, but there's one in the back in the red sweater. I guess I was just wondering in terms of editing and adding music and so forth, what's the break point? Like how much do I need to learn? as the podcast producer in order to do that myself and when is it more cost effective to hire somebody to do it? Um, I think Rachel can answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I, Adobe Audition, very simple editing. You can learn in an hour or two, like basically how to cut down a long interview. When you start layering in music and ambient sound and multiple voices, it just gets more complicated with every track that you add. Um, but that's, that's doable. If it's an interview type thing, that's totally doable. Um, but sound design, I, I find like that is way out of my wheelhouse. I find that really challenging. You know, a lot of this is pod free music, so it's kind of sketchy music. Um, so your favorite song you can't use because it's copyrighted. Um, and you're really working with this stuff and you, I don't know where the, the best to get in and get out and where's the drama. I, I just, I'm, I don't have the ear for it. So that's an art as a more than a skill. So. Yeah, there's people you can hand that off to. I mean, I think you have to kind of give yourself a learning curve. You'll get faster at it, but there's a, probably a period of time in which it will be very painful to you. I mean, part of it's just because you're learning what you like. And kind of, I say, it's sort of like, it gets harder each time because your standards get rise as you get better at it. So it's like, I've, there's like a long time in which you are a beginner. Um, and then figuring out like the scoring. Like I, I still, probably because of my training, I'm a pretty good like dialogue editor, but I like to hand stuff off for that final scoring and mastering just because like it wasn't, it's not really, it's not really my wheelhouse and other people are excellent at it and they make it sound amazing and that's like money well spent basically for me. So I think yeah. we are related actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion. Yeah. Tone deaf, but otherwise we're smart people. Oh, sorry, one suggestion because I just this morning, um, the student podcast challenge that NPR has put out for oh, yeah. their student podcast challenge because I needed an answer to that exact question. I was just happened, and there is an episode, Everything You Need to Know About Using Music in Your Podcast. Oh, good. Ten minutes. Oh, yeah. Good. Add that to our resource list. Ten we will, minutes. yeah. Also, Gimlet just put out uh, Gimlet Academy, which you have to be on Spotify, but it's a five-episode like podcasts essentially about how to get great tape, like how to think about interviewing. Uh, I always enjoy hearing Alex Bloomberg talk about craft. He's really one of the best, and not only is like making it, but also talking about how he makes it. And I found it really, it, you know, like I, it, was, it was great. I already know all this stuff, but I have an endless appetite for listening to these yeah. things. It was very good, very well done. So yeah, well, thanks, thanks so much. What a pleasure. We'll Thank be around you. for a little bit. Yeah. Happy to chat more.